welcome to the session on coffee with prab and today we have a special guest mr abhijit tripathi and chirayu mahajan um before we going to discuss about what is today special you know this is going to be a, a you know one of the best podcast especially the, the people who are into soc and forensic because i myself did lot of research uh, on this particular content which we going to produce today which is on on ransomware investigation especially akira yes it's not that akira which dance on the floor this akira is basically the one which targeting a networks and making the sock people on dance how to investigate and all that so we are here for the special podcast with the industry gate speakers if we talk about the first speaker is mr chirayu chirayu mahajan hi chirayu good good afternoon i'm audible to you hi good afternoon parab yeah. yes you're clear so me. so don't go by his suit and all that this guy is basically did a lot of investigations on crimes and all that uh you know we used to see a lot of movies on you know on forensic investigators and all that so they they're showing that kind of a skill right now but reality is different so we'll see the case study so chirai is basically having a 15 years of experience in the information security where he was involved in cyber crime investigation digital forensic investigation and uh, as a certain panel auditor oh my god as a so so here the chirai is basically also demonstrating his expertise across various domains for your information team he is into forensics risk management and now they are aligning with the rbi guidelines and all that so all those testing implementation they're doing and the best thing about these guys are basically i think you guys are associate with ana cyber forensic private limited where you guys playing a important role in digital forensics information security audits and i believe when it come to experience part chira you also dealing with lot of cases in cyber crime digital forensics and also currently they involved in lot of online social media crimes investigations and identity theft and financial fraud on the other side my brother abhijit tripathi i have seen his personally progress and uh, he is doing great 13 plus year of experience in the cyber security and he hold multiple certifications cissp ccsp ceh and uh, these are the this is certification what he obtained as a academy but when it come to the uh, uh skill based programs and all that he having expertise in the cyber forensics pen testing and compliance and uh, you if you type google and about chirayu mahajan and abhijit tripathi you can see a lot of news they have captured regarding social medias crime investigations and all that and recently abhijit also was part of a saudi aramco and fifa world cup projects where he was immensely given contributions in the forensics and also helping the companies to achieving a 27122 accreditations so i think today in this particular podcast we going to discuss about how practically they have investigated a akira ransomware trust me guys this is a video for the, those people who want to learn how ransomware works this video i think correct me if i'm wrong chirayu and abhijit can be useful for those people also who preparing for the interviews where you know in the, in the interview jobs and also they ask about how to investigate ransomware so that from that perspective also it can be a great insight and this video is also useful for the people who are into soc and they want to learn the practicality of how the ransomware works in the organization how they invade how the miter attack framework has been used and how we basically counter this particular attack right absolutely and this absolutely. guy this is not theory this is not at all theory we are coming with a practical use case with the snippets with the evidence because what they say they actually claim it and this is the best thing about soc okay so over to you guys so how are we going to start the session well first of all uh, thank you so much uh, uh, prab uh, i always call him prab bhai he has uh, i mean uh, it's it's really amazing to come on his show and uh, yes we definitely uh, you know would say that what we're going to discuss right now it is not something which is theoretical it is from our experience which we practically we gather this information when we were investigating multiple cases of ransomware and uh, obviously this is going to be very useful for people from a defensive uh, point of view as well because uh, you know uh, when the ransomware enters we just most of the people they know that ransomware encrypts and then ask for money but that is not how the things happen today is a world of hybrid encryption which uh, you know uh, earlier it was used by uh, the conti ransomware akira is again it's a part of that particular family as well using the hybrid structure and uh, it also uses dual extortion which i'm going to explain in a while but what i mean here is that you know it's not about just encryption there are a lot of things which happens like how do they initially enter the environment 
once they enter the environment, what exactly they do to get information about other systems? How do they do the lateral uh, movement within the system? How do they get into the virtual environment? How do they get into the physical environment? So every step, we're going to explain that what were our findings? How did we get to know about it? And definitely, I believe that this is going to be very useful for people uh, from a defensive perspective so that these things can be taken care of uh, while designing or uh, configuring your SIM solutions and other monitoring devices. That's, that's great. So before we're going to start this particular session, you know, um, could you please explain me about, you know, because some people are basically new to this particular uh, field and all that. I'm sure we have a different kind of audience who are watching this video. Could you start by explaining about what is Akira ransomware and, you know, how it works and uh, what can be the characteristics and what is the history behind that? Sure. So, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about Akira, as I, because we, we can, there's a lot of things about this particular, uh, you know, ransomware, but oh. uh, we'll just keep it brief, but we'll try to uh, cover most of the things about it. So when you talk about Akira, you see, if you talk about the name itself, Akira is a Japanese word for intelligent. And oh. indeed it is, is what we would say. Uh, because you see, now the thing is, the, the first mechanism which is used by this ransomware is dual extortions. If you if you ask me that, uh, what are the different types of extortion? So initially there was pure extortion, multi extortion. This is dual extortion. So what happens in dual extortion is that even though we call it a ransomware, but initially the hackers would be in, uh, you know, exfiltrating the information from the company's environment, organization's environment once they enter. And once they have stolen all the information, the last thing that they will be doing is they will be running a uh, uh, an encryption uh, executable, which would be encrypting a specific, you know, because as we know that Akira does not target all the extensions, it has specific, uh, you know, choice of its own, let's put it this way. So that is the final thing which Akira does. But before that, it starts exfiltrating the information. And that is the reason why we call that it, it, it does a dual extortion. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, that Akira uses a method which is called hybrid encryption. Now, uh, when we say hybrid encryption, because in today's discussion, we would also be discussing, we'll be touching into malware analysis. I'll be explaining in more in depth with some, uh, you know, pictures and uh, diagrams, which will make the things more clear. But uh, let's put it this way that, you know, in Akira, there were two al different algorithms which are used. One was a symmetric algorithm, which was ChaCha20. Uh, and the other one was asymmetric algorithm, which was RSA. Oh. So uh, for those who are into cryptography encryptions, as we know that asymmetric produces two keys, public and private, and ChaCha20, uh, which is a symmetric uh, stream cipher. So it would be producing a single key. And this symmetric key was actually used to encrypt the information, encrypt the data. And then this key was further encrypted with a, a public key. So there are multiple layers of encryption, which was actually done here. So that is the reason why we say that it follows a concept of hybrid encryption. So these were certain things. And the other thing, uh, you know, the next thing that, you know, uh, we would be discussing is how initially they get access into the environment. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, interesting concepts which they use so that they can cover their tracks, like, you know, uh, reflective injection, living off the land. Um, so those were pretty fascinating. So you see the methodology which is used by the hackers to put, uh, you know, get into the environment, the methodologies which are used uh, by the hackers for reconnaissance, uh, the methods which are used or the tactics and techniques which are used for, uh, you know, exfiltrating the information and for encryption, these are totally, you know, pretty unique as compared to other ransomware, which are pretty simple as compared to this, uh, what we have seen. So these are certain things, you know, which makes, uh, you know, this particular ransomware or this entire family of ransomware actually totally unique from others. That's, that's great. So, uh, you know, let's come to the action here you know a lot of people are searching for the videos we're talking about how to practically investigate ransomware and the glad that you are in you both of you guys are involved in uh in in one of the projects where you have investigated not only ransomware but you have countered that you find the root cause and everything could you share your insight could you share your experience your wisdom your thoughts in this particular channel which can be useful for others which can be a case study for them yeah sure we would definitely uh, you know uh, share uh, you know, our insights on the same. And uh, for that, what we have done is that because, you know, we wanted to make it more interactive and more uh, visual as well. So that's the reason why, you know, uh, because we definitely uh, won't be able to show the real reports as for obvious reasons. But, uh, you know, we have picked up, uh, you know, few, uh, you know, uh, what you would say, 
diagrams and other stuff and we have uh, properly anonymized them so that we can share the information without revealing the you know critical stuff mm -hmm. so that definitely we're going to use and uh, i believe we will be starting with you know uh, how the initial access thing actually happened how did yeah. you enter into yeah. the network yeah. so i think uh, that is what we're going to start with right now definitely so we'll be seeing these presentations as well however the as and when required i would also be shifting from the presentation and i'd be showing some uh, pictures and other things as and when required uh, to make the concepts more clear and more understandable from a uh, so that it becomes more visual so uh, to uh, add sure. here what uh, to what abhijit was saying uh, today we are going to discuss about what akira ransomware is and how it has uh, basically tried to infiltrate many corporations many businesses the very interesting fact about akira is that they do not have any criteria for the targets the first thing they are they are targeting anyone and everyone and the reason behind this is that uh, akira primarily is a ras that is ransomware as a service so the threat actors they have published their code and they are selling this ransomware as a service any any person can go on the dark web or get in touch with this threat actors give some money and uh, get the payload uh, to them and they can use this payload to further uh, infiltrate other organizations so this is basically a ransomware as a service and uh, it has been observed very specifically that uh, these guys they have been uh, targeting the uh, particular vulnerability which is cve 20232069 okay. and this particular vulnerability is uh, it is a, it is a, it was a zero day vulnerability which was basically uh, a person or a external uh, attacker can use their usernames or password they can brute force the login of a vpn portal n number of times there was no restriction on how or how many attempts can be made to log into the portal and so this this was a very easy pathway for the hackers to uh, launch a brute force attack and at some point of time uh, definitely those right credentials will strike and uh, they will initially get access to the vpn environment uh, so this the, what we have uh, primarily seen in our investigations is that this was a uh, the most common vulnerability that was exploited and the initial access was gained due to this due to exploiting of cv20232069 and, and, and uh, it, it is more like a spraying yeah. attack they perform when it come to the brute force and all exactly. that exactly so they, exactly they perform the spraying exactly. attack so, yeah. it, it, the the spraying attack it is a very common method that they used even before infiltrating the environment and also after infiltrating the environment so they heavily relied upon a very good dictionary and a brute force attack to crack the vpn credentials to crack the usernames the windows usernames and accounts once they infiltrated the network so yeah uh, rightly said uh, they were uh, very heavily dependent on spraying uh, spraying attacks for passwords for revealing the credentials okay that's great and at some point of time there was also a decryptor that was released by avast in the past for this ransomware uh, but uh, the threat actors they were very quick and uh, they were quite fast to come up with a forked version of it oh. the, they were able to circumvent whatever uh, decryption flaw that was uh, uh, explored by avast but uh, it had resemblance to the conti ransomware which is uh, uh, quite famous and well known in the past it has some resemblance to it and uh, interestingly they what they do is that once they infect a victim they publish their details on the website and this website is like uh, it is a onion dot onion website hosted on the tor so uh, there it can be seen that if uh, if a particular uh, entity is hacked the hacker threat actors are going to release their uh, company name a description about that company and also a very small snippet snippet of the data because as uh, abhijit correctly told that they follow a dual extortion method their final aim is not to encrypt your files but it is to first exfiltrate your files exfiltrate your data from the environment and then encrypt it so firstly they are going to hold your ransom for your own data to get access to your own data mm. and secondly if you if if if, if the victim uh, plans say they i don't i don't care about my data i don't i don't want my data back mm. they will then use the second uh, extortion method that is they'll blackmail him that if you if you don't give me money we will expose your data in internet so what these guys do is that these threat actors they are also relating uh, releasing a torrent link on their uh, blog so that uh, pe people come to know that okay actually the data has been exfiltrated and uh, it is at stake okay 
And uh, here, I would also like to add very rightly mentioned by Chirayu. And also, you can see that just like dual extortion, there is another uh, label which we found that is called multi extortion. That means they would be exfiltrating your information, they would be encrypting, and then they will also be doing a DDoS attack. Okay. So those evidences were also found in many occasions. So that again is the next level of dual extortion, which is multi extortion. And there is one more thing I would like to add here. Obviously, like uh, when they were targeting the VPNs and uh, you know they were doing the brute force, that was from outside. We were not able to trace the logs, but when once they entered and then they were doing brute forces, how did we as investigators got to know was from the same logs. Mm. So we found that there was a sudden spike in the event code 4625. I would mm. also like to make it more visual by showing some of the you know traces that we found. So please allow me a moment here. So uh, just a moment here. Okay. So uh, especially, you know, this is very important to understand that uh, you know, uh, we always say that uh, non-repudiation. So non-repudiation means that logs are the eyes and ears of a forensic investigator. I'll just show you that uh, a brief about how we recognize. So you can see this event ID, which is in Windows event uh, logs, which is 4625. So 4625 is always for failed logging attempt. And uh, 4624 is for successful logging attempt. And however, what we observed that you can clearly see that there's also something which is called substatus code. Now that gives even further, more in-depth information. As you can see, this substatus code says, uh, you know, 0xc and it ends with 6a. So 6a means that the usernames were correct, but the password which was entered was wrong. Mm. So you can see this is, and this we, we, we observed it happening, you know, in thousands and thousands within a very short span of time. Very so there was a, part. yeah, so there was a huge spike. So that definitely, and once the spike was over within five or 10 days, then the next thing that we found was 4624. 4624, this is the point that means where the attackers were able to get the you know passwords and they were now entering into other systems using those passwords. Now here, there's another interesting question that uh, how come the user's username were correct? Where did they get the username from? So that is where we discovered another interesting fact, actually. Like Chirayu very rightly mentioned that, you know, it's not only the ransomware uh, once affected, you know, in the systems, they used to sell the data, mm. but uh, there's another concept which Chirayu is going to explain where there are information for sale in the dark web, which you can purchase and then utilize it. That means in many of the cases we have found that, uh, you know, the sellers of these informations, like usernames and PIA credentials of different companies were different from the attackers who are doing the ransomware attack. So uh, I would just, uh, you know, uh, I think Chirayu, you can uh, do, uh, explain it in much better way. So uh, I'm just opening this website. This, this is one website, yeah. sawkradar.io. And uh, it is it is basically a website that gives you insight about if any of your data related to your domain is sale on the dark web or not. And, and how authentic is that? Being... Like yeah, it, it is. It is. It is quite authentic because it will give you references and links to the data where your uh, things are posted. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> what happened? Yeah, what happened? Interestingly, is that when we were investigating our cases, as Abhijit showed you the screenshot about the event code, which clearly depicts that the password is failed, the password is wrong, but the username is correct. So this brought us into a question that how did the hackers get the username? to log in into VPN portals, to log in into the active directory or to even launch a brute force attack because uh, the hacker should be clueless about the username and also the password. But interestingly, when we uh, saw or when we accessed this particular website and we saw what all data is available on the dark net, we found out that the usernames which are used to brute force, say for example, parab.nayar, okay, this particular username was used to brute force. This username was already available on the dark net as a leaked data. So they were cross verified it using other platforms as well, because there are a lot of similar websites. And also we cross verified within the dark web as well. A lot of information were there. So that's how we got to know. Oh, that that's because, you know, this is something out of box because we uh, normally, when we go for any investigation based on the logs, we basically do counter and based on that, we do the further continuous strategy, but that's a good thing that you have verified the information. What is the source? So first yeah. fundamental rule as a SOC investigator or a, any, you know, SOC, expert and all that you, know, you need to verify the details what you claim to be even the logs can generate a false positive true that's true but surprisingly you know when you're talking about these vulnerabilities they have so these vulnerabilities are then router or in the firewall or what exactly is that because the initial parameter will be your router or firewall so you mean to say this yeah. vulnerability was there in router firewalls 
it was there on the see every firewall it has a web interface hmm true so this For vulnerability management. was in the web interface of the firewall okay because the web interface had a username and password uh, login field hmm. there should be uh, by default every every system has a uh, you can say a defense wherein after five attempts there will be a pull down or there will be a lock out of the account hmm. here the vulnerability was a person can do n number of attempts to check their username and password Understood. so this the portal the, the web portal was uh, missing a security mechanism to check that uh, whether a brute force attempt is happening or not understood and so it allowed the hackers to unlimitedly make authentication attempts and uh, finally they were struck with the key but th- see that that is just the tip of the iceberg the hacker is just getting access to the vpn he is yet he is not yet got access to the network he has got the initial access to the vpn network which is simply allocating him an ip address to the bigger infrastructure the ip pool the network pool okay the next the next part starts here the interesting part starts here that when he gets an ip address when he is into the network he now uh, the next part for the hacker is to find the weakest system in the network there is where they start scanning the network seeing what operating systems have been used are there any known vulnerabilities or uh, uh, like any weak operating systems the maximum uh, things that we have seen the maximum evidences that we have seen in the investigation is that the infrastructure is properly built there are good defenses but just a weak operating system a outdated operating system is the entry point for the hacker to exploit the entire system and more network. thing is the stupidity of the people who click on yeah. the links yeah, so, yeah uh, absolutely true and there is a reason a, why we, we have a patch for technology we have a patch for services but we, there is no patch for human stupidity people process and technology people a very dangerous element and yeah. uh, so that's why i was just showing uh, to add to what chirayu mentioned that obviously the cv which we just showed that was one of the major reasons in most of the investigations that we found mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but apart from that spear phishing also played a very important role because you see it's pretty interconnected that you know these websites in dark web are already selling the credentials mm-hmm. in many occasions we have seen the credentials also had username and password emails as well so you know the the adversaries they would be purchasing these information and if they want to target a certain organization we have also seen cases where spear phishing was used where they had the uh, they had the email addresses so on those email addresses they were actually sh- sending links and other things uh, where you know we found that the employees were clicking on it and direct download of malicious code ransomware was there into the environment so that was like a direct entry to the environment so uh, i would highly recommend that you know phishing campaigns should be done on a very regular basis in organizations because this was also in many occasions one of the methods how they got the initial entry and that was like a direct entry hmm. so it's pretty easy for the hackers so very rightly mentioned that you know people should be very aware of these things now the thing is that once they enter the environment what was the next thing they happen and i think uh, chirayu i would request him to continue with this just want to add this human factor as well human error yeah so uh, once once they are into the environment the the interesting fact about akira threat actors is that they not only made their payloads for windows environment but they also made their payload for a linux environment and uh, not because they are interested to encrypt the linux servers their intention was to basically target the virtualized environment especially yes exercise so yeah, yes exercise but virtual environment are often considered more secure how does akira manage the infiltrated and target this environment yes uh, interesting question parab so uh, here the thing is that uh, what they uh, the trend is that virtual environments needs to uh, right now virtual environments are used to host the servers if uh-huh. there are multiple servers if there are a lot of resource sharing uh, vmware or uh, using a virtual environment is the best option for corporates oh. and uh, the threat actors they needed a solution to this on how to strike the virtual environments in one go so what uh, abhijit is going to do right now is that abhijit is going to show you a screenshot okay wherein that shows a methodology on how they used a virtual environment to just with a with a single click or with a few clicks they were able to encrypt and they were able to target hundreds of servers all together just okay. because it was a virtual environment mm-hmm. and uh, th- that was that that was because what they do is that say i i give you a scenario okay for the viewers also that there are say 100 servers in a virtual environment what these hackers did is that uh, once they are into the network they uh, while performing the reconnaissance they came to know that okay there is a uh virtual environment there and there is a login portal also for this virtual environment uh, for, unfortunately you can say the login portals for the virtual environment were also synced with the active directory hmm. 
That is now, the reason why I when, straight away came to this countermeasure. I was keeping it for the later <laughs> set, but because you know, Prab asked this question, so this is a major issue that we observed, and this should not be the case actually. So, you know, or both the rights were provided without any segregation. As you can see, we have kept it for the countermeasures. The problem is that domain admins in Windows Active Directory environment also had VMware vSphere admin privileges. So in that case, you know. the hackers who already were into the internal environment but we'll also explain that once they enter the internal environment they also practice certain reconnaissance to gather more informations and also they were able to get into uh, you know uh, admin credentials and they were specifically targeting certain ad uh, files which were giving them more information about the active directory environment and that is where they got the username and password of multiple you know people who had global admin privileges and other privileges and that is what we found that these privileges also included access to you know the vspr client why we are talking about vspr client this is again for esxi for uh, you know there is also another virtualization which is hyper v but in both the cases one thing is pretty similar that if you have the admin privileges you can make a lot of changes to that so generally the solution that we would propose as you can see in the solution is that segregate the admin accounts that is the one of the best thing that you know if these are high level high privileged accounts then why to give both the access to the same account so that okay. has to be done but unfortunately you know for the ease of access probably in many organizations we have seen that both are given to the same and that is what helped the hackers as well to enter the virtual environment so that is the thing right right and uh, uh, what these uh, threat actors did is that once they were into the virtual environment they did not go targeting each and every server there true what they did is that they basically used this admin privilege in the virtual environment to disconnect the storages of the servers and th there is a huge storage pool when there is a data center or when there is a huge uh, large uh, virtual environment there is a storage pool they created a new virtual machine in the environment because they had admin rights now when they create a new virtual machine the whatever edrs or whatever antiviruses are deployed on the other virtual machines the new machine does not have it because this is a fresh entry into the system and uh, what he did is that uh, they created a new machine and they attached the entire network storage pool to this one particular machine okay. so say example there is a 40 40 tb net uh, storage pool oh. so uh, yeah exactly what i see it on the screen as we saw now the threat actors they in the first step they actually uh, uh, access the vspr or the virtual environment and uh, in the second step what they do is that they disconnect the storage from the actual machines and they connect in the third step they connect this storage to the new vm that they have created a single vm a single windows operating system and uh, now in this in the third scenario there will be one system with a 40 tb of storage attached to it and yep. if the actor runs this uh, payload the akira payload on this particular operating system the entire 40 tb of storage is encrypted okay so in in this way he is not uh, he is not attacking uh, the 80 servers or 100 servers in the pool he is attacking the storage that is attached to this 80 servers okay and there is one more thing as you can see that most of the virtual machines they were governed by the edrs but because this is a brand new virtual machine which was created by the hacker himself so they were not under the control of the edr so edr logs were generated because of which we got to know about few things later but when the attacker encrypted the you know the storage pool edr was not edr was unfortunately not able to do anything because you know it was the, the new machine was not coming under the edr control so that was the whole point of the attacker once entering the environment creating a new virtual machine and so setting I, up the so, yeah so i have one question i'm sorry i'm interrupting here it's it's lot of complexities there in this terms so if we keep it simple you know step one was by spare phishing they have targeted a internal threats you sorry employee of the company you mean to say so because uh, it's very important for us to understand how this attack is actually origin because origin is very important yeah so there are multiple ways mm. if it was spear phishing then they are directly getting access to any of the systems which are already there in the internal environment that would be mm. pretty easy for the hackers mm. however mm. in most of the cases they as very rightly mentioned by chirayu they were targeting the you know vpn uh you know services which are provided by different vendors and uh, because there was a vulnerability because of yeah. which they were able to do the brute force but yeah. we have to understand that once they did this attack they were able to enter the internal environment but once they enter the internal environment they also have to do further reconnaissance where they would know that in this environment what are the systems what are the operating systems which definitely. are running on the systems definitely. and ips definitely. and also they definitely. definitely did the reconnaissance and that is where they actually found out certain servers which were pretty outdated 
like Windows 2012 and other things. Once they found, their initial step was to exploit the vulnerabilities which were found in these servers. Okay. And that was the first thing where they got the first hold into few of the servers which are in the network. And now the thing is once they, so I'll just go back to one slide where we have also mentioned about the same. So you can see that once they got hold of these servers, within this, they were, they started doing the SAM dump. And they started, you know, uh, using different methods to crack and, you know, extract the information hmm. from which they got to know about user credentials, some admin credentials, and using those credentials, they further got more privileges. Now, these privileges were then used to gather further more data. Now, you can see that after this, what we observed was RDP was very highly used. Why? Because, you know, if you have admin privileges, because generally when the SID is the end with 500, that is like an admin account. So uh, also they got some user accounts as well. Using those, they tried to gather more information about some other systems which are in the network and a lot of, again, reconnaissance tools were used. However, some methods we will talk about in the later stage that what methods were used, but their prime target was AD servers. Okay. Their prime target, because using the admin account, they were able to log into certain AD servers. Why AD server was the prime target? Because you can, you can understand that if they get into any AD server, they will get to know about the groups, uh, you know, the users, the credentials, and a lot of other things. And if they exfiltrate this information, these information can further be used to literally moment within the uh, AD environment, right? Definitely. So uh, now we have to understand this, that when they initially enter the environment and got hold of few of the systems, as I mentioned, because they were vulnerable. So from here, the attack was divided into two parts as you can clearly see on your screen, because the hackers found that some of the admin privileges also had privileges to access virtual environment. Mm. So you see, that is where very rightly mentioned by Chirayu, the entire methodology of entering into the virtual environment, creating a new virtual server that was done. And in many cases, we found that because the environment was ESXi, so that is the region, that is one of the reasons why the Linux version of Akira was created to target virtual environments, which are, you know, hosted on ESXi using the, you know, vSphere client, they were able to log in and they were able to, you know, encrypt the entire thing. And that is the, that is the reason for having the Linux version of Akira. That is one of the major reasons. The yeah. second thing was that attackers tried to access to AD servers extract information about the AD servers. And from those informations, they utilize it to further make more lateral moment. How we got to know, there are a lot of indicators that we found. I will be showing some screenshots uh, of some event mm -hmm. IDs, which uh, played a very prominent role for us to detect these kind of activities. We will get into it. Like what were the processes? Uh, what were the IDs generated when something was executed? How PowerShell was used? How WMI was used? So we'll get into those things, but you know, the answer to your question is this is how you know the lateral moment and entry actually started so i hope this gives a clarity on yeah that. definitely yeah the, the concept of the threat actors is that once they find a weak system in the environment they will take control of the environment in order to establish their command and control center so okay. that will be the point wherein they will deploy all their tools they will paste all their uh, uh, scripts and from there they'll be starting a further attack into the environment And you can see that, uh, like I was talking about that once they enter the internal environment, got some credentials, first action was that they, it's just, it's just like a group dividing their task. Mm. So, you know, the first thing was, okay, we got access to the virtual environment. Let's just take care of that. And mm. the second thing was, you know, for the physical environment where AD was implemented. So you see, once they moved into a server where AD was hosted, their target was this particular file, ntds.dit file. Okay. Why? Because you see, uh, this file comprises of a lot of information about AD. Like you can see credentials such as password hashes, group membership information, access control details, computers and other domain objects which are there in the AD. You can extract this information. Now, there are two ways of extracting the information. One is you run some executables and get the information. But we have to understand that if the hackers run some, they were pretty intelligent. They said that if we run some executable, that would create traces. We will come to that as well, that how you can trace if something was executed by using dis different registry hives, but the hackers did not want that. So that this is where, you know, to extract these information, they were using some techniques, which Chirayu would be explaining, like living off the land, reflective, uh, you know, uh, what you call injections. And in order to access these servers, they're using RDP. And because they were using RDP, 
so that is the reason why we got to know that okay these kind of methods were used because we were harvesting the rdp cash using our specialized tools so i think chirayu you would be uh, able yeah, to explain yeah. it from here a, a very interesting uh, yeah. piece of uh, digital evidence that we were able to unearth from uh, the systems that we were investigating is the rdp bitmap cash so i'll, I'll just explain it on yeah, the screen i'll just explain about what rdp bitmap bitmap cash is yeah when when two systems are communicating via an rdp for the ease of communication and uh, for a quick uh, if there is low bandwidth for the quick uh, sharing of the screen there is something known as rdp bitmap cache that is stored so the portion of the screen that is unchanged during interaction of an rdp session the unchanged portion of the screen gets stored in the cache so that can be uh, it can be presented to the user quickly now this is this is a windows feature it can be enabled and disabled by default it is enabled in the windows environment but what we were able to do is that when this hacker he has used uh, windows rdp to connect to systems and execute his tools we extracted the rdp bitmap cache and when we extracted the rdp bitmap cache we were able to see it in the above the screenshot which is in front of the viewers it is in small snippets very small oh, chunks oh, oh. okay using digital forensic tools we were able to extract these chunks and so, what we did is that we reconstructed these chunks together and we were able to get a portion of the screen that the hacker was able to see when he took a rdp of a system oh. and this reveals very interesting data about yeah. which scripts the hacker was using what kind of reflective injection he was trying to achieve here here we can see that uh, he has been trying to enumerate the domain and before we go to this also uh, you know when we talk about reflective injection because we are using this term again and again so it means that nothing would be going to the hard drive it is directly executed in the memory so you know these all scripts they were directly executed in the memory itself so leaving no traces especially for investigators and we got to know about it not from the system we got to know because of the rdp cache there were traces and it took us a good amount of time to you know combine the information and make Uh, so that it makes sense to us and these this is just a sample of you know the combinations that we uh, you know now these are full fledged scripts and each script you can see is to infil infiltrate or extract information from the file in the adb which i was talking about and these gives more information about the groups the members and other things and uh, here us uh, the tool which was used was powersploit so i would just show on the screen what is the, what is the purpose of this powersploit yeah so there is a screen and uh, Sorry, Chira, you please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is only so, for the education uh, purpose, I believe. Uh, absolutely, not, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, yes, this uh, this is an intrusive tool. Ethical, and it should be yeah, <laughs> it should be definitely used only for educational purposes. So, uh, what I was going to say here is that uh, the reflective injection uh, at this point of time, when the hacker was uh, doing reflective injection, he was not only he was having he having access to a particular uh, he was having access to the VPN, then he was having access to a particular weak system that he has exploited into the network, and when he exploited that system in the network, the first thing the hackers did is they they did a SAM dump, so they did a, a credential dump of whatever credential hashes are stored in the system. They did a dump of that, and that that is the point when they get certain kind of uh, privilege in the uh, network and by using those uh, user accounts they uh, they basically initiated uh, the scripts they ran the scripts on other servers on other active directory servers or other systems in the network right taking the rdp connection and that is basically a, a you know I, i i was aware about this tool but this is how it was going to be used i never thought <laughs> So you right. can see that clearly the traces were there. We were able to extract because they took RDP connection mm. from the RDP cache. But uh, you know, even you know, in forensic, we definitely we take clones, we make images, we process it. But you would not get too much of traces because uh, you know, as I said, as you know, the method which was used was reflective injection, directly getting executed in the memory. So uh, that's the reason why you see this is exactly. Uh, even we got to know about that power exploit was used from the RDP cache actually when we reconstructed it. So that is the thing. That is the beauty of you know uh, using uh, these kind of weapons of uh, mass destruction is what I would say. So uh, is it one of the tools? So uh, like, have they used a combination of multiple tools? Because definitely tools and techniques will be there to observe a kit of our infections or in some way. So it is one of them, or how? How? What about the other tools? Yeah. there are, there is there is a list of tools that they okay. have used 
okay but i would like to highlight a point here is that they made maximum use of the native tools okay for for example for taking rdps they used the windows client hmm for encryption they used the windows uh, encryption library hmm oh, okay yeah so so it's not uh, a hi fi for... it's not something okay very commercial or something like that they just use the existing functionality only to hack absolutely hmm. absolutely True. and uh, uh, and to uh, and to gain persistence to have constant access to the machine that they have pri- uh, initially exploited hmm. any desk was the tool that was used by them so what okay. they did is that uh, they infiltrated into the vpn they hmm. hacked into the system and they installed any desk on only one of the system so that they can anytime take the remote from the internet to access hmm. it they did not log into the vpn and they can get into the system yeah. and then attack another systems in that 